Good afternoon, and welcome to the Law Student Series, the Judge Advocate Panel. My name is Laura, and I will be your session organizer. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to mention. Please feel free to use the question and answer box on the left-hand side of your screen to submit any questions. Questions will be taken at the end of the presentation. An interactive poll will appear during the presentation, as well as a survey at the conclusion. Please be sure to complete these. Now please join me in welcoming our moderator, Deputy Chief for the Army Judge Advocate Recruiting Office, Taylor Matson. Taylor? Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. Um, we are so excited that all of you could join us today. Um, very, very glad to hear that you are all interested in learning more about careers in um, the Department of Defense and the Coast Guard um, for Judge Advocates. So we have with us um, some wonderful folks who I am going to call on one by one and ask them to introduce themselves. They're going to tell you a little bit about themselves, what their current position is, how long they've been in the JAG Corps, and what law school they attended. Um, after we do intros, I'm going to ask some questions, and these are all probably general questions that you guys may have. Um, the, you may not get an answer from every service on every question, and what that likely means is that, uh, that whatever service has answered the question, the other services operate very similarly. So I encourage all of you, if you are interested in pursuing a career in the JAG Corps, that you look at all of the services. We always encourage applicants, if they are interested and would be willing to serve in multiple services, to go ahead and um, do their research and potentially apply to more than one service. That is not looked at as a negative among our services. Um, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to put them in the Q&A box. We will more than likely address them at the end because I think we're going to cover the broad topics that a lot of you probably have questions about. So with that, I'm going to introduce everyone individually and have them uh, tell you a little bit about themselves. So first, we will start off with Major Tyler Musselman with the Air Force. Tyler? Thank you, Taylor. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Major Tyler Musselman. I, my current position, I'm the Chief of Recruiting for the Air Force JAG Corps. Uh, I hold this position for about another month until I move uh, to go be the second in charge of the base legal office that's at McCord Field, uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington State. Uh, I'm in my second year as a Chief of Recruiting. Prior to taking on the recruiting role, uh, I was mainly focused in criminal law. Uh, about 10 years ago now, I started in a base legal office as a prosecutor. Uh, I then uh, to deployed. When I came back from deployment at about year two and a half, I was a trial defense counsel for two years and then came to the D.C. region in 2015 where I was an appellate government counsel for three years. So mostly criminal law. Uh, until I got to the chief of recruiting position, and I've been in for almost 10 years now. Uh, I'm an Iowa boy, born and raised, went to undergrad at the University of Iowa and law school at the University of Iowa as well. Thank you, Tyler. Next, we will introduce Lieutenant Jillian Talley from the Coast Guard. Jillian? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me uh, to be here today or this afternoon. Um, I have been with the Coast Guard for three years now, so uh, relatively new, but a lot, um, I've been able to get a lot of experience in that three years. I started off in our claims and litigation office, so I did all things civil law. Um, I worked very closely with DOJ attorneys to um, prosecute claims against the Coast Guard, anything from wrongful death to FOIA requests to um, government vehicle accidents, um, you know, whether our search and rescue gone wrong and now someone's suing the Coast Guard for, you know, negligence or wrongful death or whatever it may be. So a lot fell under uh, that umbrella. I did that for my first two years. Um, I was lucky enough to go down to uh, 
base Quantico and hang out with the uh, Marines for three months. I worked um, with them as trial counsel, so as prosecutor, and got a little bit of military justice experience. And then I came back to Coast Guard headquarters um, and started my job as a special victims counsel. Um, it's a job kind of unique to the military services. I uh, represent victims of sex-related offenses. Um, and I've been doing that for a year now. Um, lots of great experience. I also worked as an admiral's aide for a year, so I got to travel around with our Judge Advocate General and um, meet a lot of really great people, um, so a lot of travel involved as well. I am from South Louisiana, born and raised. I went to undergrad at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, and then I got my JD at Loyola, New Orleans. I then actually went to Tulane for my LLM in Energy and Environmental Law. Um, and I got to, I, I didn't mention that, but I did get to work on some environmental oil pollution cases uh, while I was in Claims and Lit. So I made good use of my degree there. Um, but that is short snapshot. Um, like I said, I've only been in for three years, but uh, tons of experience. Thank you, Jillian. Next, we will hear from Captain Jeff Irving from the Marine Corps. Jeff? Hey, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Captain Jeff Irving, I'm currently with Marine Corps Recruiting Command. I'm the Deputy Staff Judge Advocate, and I dual chair also as the manager for our Judge Advocate Recruiting Program. Um, I've been in the Marine Corps for six years now, the Marine Corps puts you directly into a military justice track in your first tour. So I spent about my first three years as a trial counsel um, prosecuting felonies and special, special victim cases in Camp Pendleton, California, in the San Diego area. And actually, we had a partnership with the Coast Guard as well. So I got to work with a Coast Guard lieutenant on a lot of those cases, which was great. Um, that was the best job I ever had uh, as a prosecutor, and um, now I'm in a, uh, a deputy staff judge advocate role, which where I deal with all the national um, legal issues that arise in our, and also actually international recruiting programs for the Marine Corps, and then also guide all of our new applicants to the Marine Corps judge advocate program. Um, I am also a graduate of the University of Iowa College of Law, Go Hawks, and I went to undergraduate in Rutgers University. I also have a LLM from Tsinghua University in Beijing, and through the Marine Corps, I'm currently attending a master's program at the National Intelligence University in Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you, Jeff. Next, we have Lieutenant Barbara Strauss from the Navy. Barbara? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. I'm Lieutenant Barbara Strauss. I work at Code 61. I'm currently um, an assistant programs officer. I'm the intern extern program manager and the awards program manager as well at Code 61. I've been in for only three years, but I also have had quite a diverse amount of experiences. I did the first tour judge advocate program, which is, I believe, unique to the Navy, where we do six months in command services, six months in um, legal assistance, and then a full year now in either trial or defense. And I did my year in defense. It was great. I got to travel and represent sailors from all over in a multitude of different cases. Um, so that was great. And now I'm at headquarters working in the um, personnel department. I also am a Jersey girl, born and raised, sort of like the Ohio boy. I went to Rutgers University undergrad and then Rutgers Law School. So pretty much the first time I ever really left New Jersey for any substantial time was with the Navy, and it's been great. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And finally, Major Sharon Shim from the Army. Sharon? Thank you, Taylor. Hi, everyone. This is Major Sharon Shim. I am. I work in the recruiting office with Taylor Mathson, uh for the Army, and I've been in the JAG Corps almost nine years now. I went to William and Mary for law school, so just down the road. 
And uh, just briefly, over those nine years, I spent about half that time doing criminal law. Um, I did about two years as a prosecutor and two years as a defense attorney. Um, I've done a few different positions practicing administrative law, operational law, had the opportunity to deploy a career to Afghanistan, was stationed in Korea for a year uh, with the brigade as the, the lead judge advocate for that unit. And so it's been really fantastic getting to serve all over the world in all different types of positions and lots of, lots of experience. As you heard from everyone, you get a lot of great experience really fast in pretty much all the services here. So, um, yep, that's all. Thank you. Wonderful, and I will stick with you, Major Shim, for our first question. Um, if you can answer what the first four years as a judge advocate looks like uh, in the Army. Sure thing. So the first four years in the Army, you know, generally it's, I would say the most common track is to start off in something like legal assistance. Um, and I'll say that this is most often for those who are direct commissionees, so not someone with any prior experience or prior experience in the military or otherwise, who are just kind of coming in blind. Um, most often, you'll either start with legal assistance or an administrative law job, and oftentimes we'll swap, I would say, the first one to two years. That would be the most common. And then switching into military justice. And so usually they try to keep you in your first duty station. I would say one, um, two to three years. Three is, is more common in my experience if they can, depending on the size of the installation. Sometimes they can't. And so, you know, if, if obviously if you're at a larger installation, they'll want to move you around a little bit more so that you have more opportunities. But if you're somewhere where there's a lot of opportunities to do all those things, then you can do, you know, something like legal assistance, which I think, again, similar throughout the services, legal assistance is an office where it's kind of like a legal aid for, you know, DOD ID card holders. So that can be dependents and also soldiers. And, you know, folks can come in, there, retirees as well, can come in for all different types of assistance. So that can be anything from wills. It can be help with landlord tenant issues. It can truly be any, any kind of issue that they need. You know, I did, you know, help with adoption, you know, paperwork. We helped with divorce if it was, you know, something that they didn't need to, if they were going to do it on their own, essentially. Um, it really runs the gamut. And it's a great way to get to know soldiers. It's a great way to get introduced into the Army. And then when you have a little bit more experience, they throw you into military justice, which is when, you know, more often than not, now in the Army, we're moving towards a system where you start off a year as what's called a military justice advisor, where you're going to kind of do the, you know, sit in and do kind of the lower level military justice work. So you kind of understand a little bit more, have that opportunity to learn, and then you'll transition into a full on trial counsel prosecutor. And so that's, I would say, the most common track for the first four years in the Army. Wonderful. Thank you. And next, um, I will turn it over to Major Musselman, who will tell us what the first four years in the Air Force is like. Thanks, Taylor. So uh, wherever you're going to find uh, decent size active duty Air Force installations, you'll find a legal office. And the way that the Air Force JAG Corps is structured is uh, our legal offices are basically a full stop shop for that entire installation. And so the legal office practices, I would say, in three general portfolios, they uh, basically function as a district attorney's office because they're going to prosecute courts martial and handle other military justice actions that may fall short of a court martial. They're going to do the legal assistance piece. Uh, you know, that, that legal aid portion as well. And then the third portfolio is going to look like a general counsel's office in that they're going to advise the commander and his or her agents, you know, other subordinate commanders on things like labor law, contracts, ethics, operational law, military justice. Um, and so that's all self-contained in our legal offices. And so that means our initial assignment judge advocates, they're going to be at a legal office for two years. 
they're going to try courts, they're going to do legal assistance, and they're going to hold a portfolio, um, which they could be the chief of labor or the chief of environmental law or the chief of operations law, while they're trying cases and doing legal assistance. And then every nine to 12 months, uh, they're going to rotate through different positions in the office. So it's while still trying courts and doing legal assistance. So it's a dynamic sort of switch gears. One week you could try court martial, the next week you're back to doing legal assistance and then advising a commander on the ethics and airspace issues and, and uh, environmental law issues because they want to extend the runway on an installation. Um, and so you do that for your first two years, then you'll move. And as far as years three and four, common positions we see are if you like to litigate and you're, hap and you're decent at it, those are the folks we pick to go be trial defense counsel. Um, if you're more legal assistance minded, then uh, that's where we'll put people in special victims counsel positions in years three and four. Or uh, if you like the administrative part of it, the general counsel piece, we have individuals that will go on to a different base legal office in years three and four. Um, and, and we try to get them away from the base they were initially signed and sort of get them different clientele. If they were at a fighter base their first two years, maybe this second base is going to be one of our procurement installations that's more contract heavy. So our stuff is all self-contained. We don't split people between, you know, a stint in legal assistance and then a stint in SJ advice. We sort of do it all at once within a, a self-contained office. Wonderful, thank you. Next, uh, Lieutenant Jillian Talley from the Coast Guard is gonna tell us what their first four years is like. So our, uh, our first four years legal offices are um, kind of a general practitioner type uh, situation. So a lot of times our first tour Judge advocates will go to a district or an area office, um, and you will handle a plethora of issues there. So whether it's operational stuff, so that's going to be fisheries, uh, law enforcement, um, migrant interdiction, drugs, all that um, sexy stuff. And then you'll also have um, command, uh, command advice, so you'll have certain Coast Guard units assigned to you um, that that legal office covers in their AOR. So you're going to have um, COs, commanding officers, XOs reaching out to legal and you're going to give command advice. Um, to a limited extent, you also have some military justice when you're at a district. A lot of times um, in order to get everyone um, all the experience that they possibly can in their first few years, they will um, put a district attorney on uh, a few court marshals while they're in the district. We also have a legal service command in Alameda, California, as well as Norfolk, Virginia. And that's where a lot of our um, prosecutors are. And they, um, they focus solely on military justice. So you also could be in a trial counsel billet in one of those legal service command offices and do nothing but court martials and administrative separations in your first two years. Generally, we don't send uh, first four judge advocates to defense positions. We actually have a partnership with the Navy and our, uh, our Coast Guard defense attorneys work out of uh, Navy defense shops. But like I said, typically that's gonna be um, year three or four, not your first two years. We generally have three-year tour lengths, so if you're at a district, it's probably going to be three years. Um, our defense jobs, as well as our special victim counsel jobs, are only two years. Um, they tend to be more demanding jobs, so they're shorter tours. Um, another possibility for your first assignment is going to be Coast Guard Headquarters, which is where I'm at in Washington, D.C., and um, headquarters is kind of where um, you know, the brains of the operation. So you have different offices that have dedicated areas of practice, um, one of them being, you know, claims and litigation. We also have an environmental law office. We have um, 
administrative law. Uh, we also have uh, operational law and international law office here at headquarters. Um, so if you end up at a headquarters tour, you're going to have a more specific uh, practice area. But the district and area legal offices are going to be general practitioners, and then also a legal service command um, can be that option. We generally have pretty great locations because um, by the nature of the job, we've got to stick close to the close to the coast. Um, so most of our our assignment areas are big metropolitan areas. Um, so it's really great for family and work life balance. Um, so you really can't get a bad gig for your first assignment because we have pretty pretty great um, depending on how you feel about Alaska and Cleveland. Uh, other than those two, uh, and I can make fun of Cleveland because my fiance is from Cleveland, so I'm sorry if I offended anybody. Uh, but other than those two options, uh, we we tend to have pretty great locations. So um, uh, that adds to your your first four years as well. Thank you. And then next, we will hear from Lieutenant Strauss Benigni. Hi, everyone. So I just wanted to differentiate. There is a pretty stark difference between the Navy and the other branches with regard to the first four years. We're still doing a first tour judge advocate program. It's sort of like a secondary training program, which will take place your first two years. That's after you go to ODS, which is in Newport, Rhode Island. That's five weeks. Um, after ODS, um, depending on your bar passage and the timing, you'll likely go right to NJS also in Newport, Rhode Island for 10 weeks. That's an um, intensive uh, basic lawyer course that we share with the Coast Guard and the Marines. Um, from there, you go to your first duty station, which can be at one of nine places. They're all on our website. Um, I can tell you really quick, it's Groton, Connecticut, BC, Norfolk, Jackson, Court, Pensacola, Great Lakes, San Diego, Hawaii, Guam, Washington State, Bahrain, Uraswa, Diego Garcia, Singapore, and Japan. Those are those are the big installations that we have the resources to train first tours. So that's where we send them. Um, and then there, during your first two years, you get to do the six six twelve program. And it used to be six 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 six. You would get six months in trial, six months in defense, but they found that you know, six months in each isn't really enough time for you to get like a full grasp of the system. So now they just say, okay, you're either going to do a whole year in defense or a whole year in trial. And that's probably going to be the year where you learn the most and you do the most. Um, you know, legal assistance is also great to get experience. You're doing um, wills, helping sailors with divorces, um, you know, you name it, uh, financial issues, any sort of like... Um, contract issues they have, helping them with leases, all of those things. And then for the command services, six months you're doing, you know, anything that the command needs, it really does have such a wide range that it would take a really long time to explain it all, but it's essentially anything that the command would need um, for legal support. And it can range from operational to jurisdictional to, you know, you name it, you're doing like line of duty investigations to see if this sailor was technically on duty when he got hurt, you're um, looking into all kinds of things. It's really interesting. And then your last year, you're doing defense counsel or trial counsel. I was defense counsel. I had, you know, over 25 ad set boards, maybe three or four BOIs, which are for officers getting separated. Um, and I helped to a court martial. And a lot of the um, first tours in the Navy do get detailed to more than one court martial often. So um, it's, it's a great experience. And then for your second tour, which is your next two years, you're going to be anywhere from a coded billet, which is where I'm at now. You can be a mini on a, judge, on a um, ship. You can be, you know, an, SJ, an independent SJA, uh, really a lot of different billets. So that's pretty much what our first four years looks like. And as I said before, the first tour judge advocate program is intended to sort of help you transition into being like fully independent. At the same time, you have a lot of responsibilities and you're, you're expected to sort of hit the ground running. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, next, one of the big questions we often get 
um, is what physical fitness is really like uh, in the day-to-day -day of being a judge advocate. So I'm not going to have um, our panelists talk so much about the actual physical fitness testing. All of you can find that relatively easily online, what the standards are. Um, but I will let our panelists talk a little bit about what, how physical fitness is incorporated into that day-to-day -day routine as a judge advocate. So we will start off um, with the service that is typically viewed as the most physically fit, um, and that would be with Captain Irving and the Marine Corps. Jeff? Thanks so much, Taylor. Uh, again, Captain Jeff Irving, United States Marine Corps. Um, I'll kind of break this answer up into two pieces. Uh, first being what it's like day to day once you get to your primary duty station and are working as a judge advocate, and then I'll come back to what it takes to become a Marine officer and a Marine judge advocate. I think counter to the stereotype, once you are a judge advocate and you hit the fleet and you take on your book of business or the many courts martial that are awaiting service, um, you, you're not going to have a like a 0630 Reveille and running with the Marines uh, out of Hollywood stereotype. You're going to be a professional. You're going to be trusted to stay in shape and stay within the physical training guidelines of the Marine Corps. So being able to run three miles, uh, do 23 pull-ups, and however many crunches in two minutes. Um, you're going to be expected to do that because you're a Marine officer and um, you'll be expected to do that and then also maintain your caseload. So when you become a judge advocate, you're primarily going to be focused on your job. You'll have Marines working for you that you'll PT, so you'll be in charge of creating their physical training regimen. Um, but by the time you get through our initial periods of training, uh, you, you'll know how to do that, and you'll be at a physical point where you'll be able to do that. So that's my answer for the first part um, in what it's like in the day-to-day -day process. So the short answer is you will have to PT your Marines occasionally, but you'll have a staff and CO helping you with that as well. Going back to the initial training pipeline, to become a Marine Corps officer, I would say, is much harder than maintaining. So becoming, you have to uh, compete with peers across all of the different components, ground, air, and now cyber, um, to get selected to become a Marine officer. Go through officer candidate school, where you go again through the same training to may uh, gain the basic skills of Marine Corps leadership, and then go through the best tactical finishing school in the world, which is the basic school, which is six months of intense physical training and intense military education, where you go up to 20-mile weighted hikes, and um, again, working with infantry officers and air officers to become a basically trained Marine officer. So that will be the most physical part of your first four-year timeline. Uh, once you get to your duty station, the day-to-day -day, um, will really just be maintaining um, and working on your own schedule. And that's all I got, Taylor. Wonderful. Next, we will hear from the Air Force. Thanks, Taylor. This is Major Todd Musselman, uh, Air Force Jay Corps. So, uh, our, our fitness test is a mile and a half run, a minute of push-ups, a minute of sit-ups, and a waist measurement. Uh, what I will say is when you when you come in, you're expected to stay fit and, uh, you know, be the lead uh, example for the individuals that you're responsible for, mainly your paralegals and also the young JAGs that come in. But also, right, the JAGs are there to set good order and discipline. We discharge individuals for failing their fitness tests, so we like to sort of set the standard. Um, most of the offices that you're going to go to, you're going to be given PT time on your own, whether it's come in at 8.30 on Monday, Tuesday, Friday, or people just going at lunchtime saying, hey, i got to go for a run to clear my mind. Um, gym access on the installations, and they usually, they usually do a good job of outfitting those gyms. Um, so I, it's an expectation to stay fit. There's an extra motivation as well. We typically test every six months, but if you score an excellent on our fitness assessment, you only have to test every year. So you see a lot of people shoot for that so that they can then go back to sort of their normal fitness regimen um, that may not be sort of targeted at the, the fitness assessment. And so when it comes to applications, our selection board members look at 
the height weight maximum that you can find online for the Air Force. But then also during interviews, law students, attorneys are asked, what are you doing to stay fit? And uh, our selection boards are members, our selection board members are looking at that because they know that that's going to be something that individuals are going to need to set the example for throughout their career. Um, thanks, Taylor. Wonderful. And obviously, all of the services differ slightly. We've given you a, a taste of kind of two different um, sort of fitness regimens. Um, and what the training pipeline looks like. Um, Want to answer one of the questions very briefly that was asked was, do you get deployed as a judge advocate? Um, and in all the services, yes, although those may look differently based on what the service does and what activities they're engaged in. Um, but you can certainly reach out uh, to judge advocates in all the different services and see what those deployments are like. Um, but typically, if you are assigned to a specific unit and that unit is deploying, then you go along with that unit. Um, next, I am going to ask Lieutenant Strauss to start us off um, to cover any available internship or externship opportunities that your service has. Hi, yes. Um, so typically we do have a summer internship program and both fall and spring externship programs. Unfortunately, due to COVID, canceled the summer internship program, unfortunately, and now we have just also canceled our fall externship. Uh, we're really hopeful that we're going to be back back up on, uh, on our game coming the spring externship. And um, the main reason that we're not able to really satisfy the externship and um, internship is because we don't have someone in-house that does fingerprinting. So for the summer, we had so many people have issues with getting their fingerprints done, and that's absolutely a requirement for us. So we just decided instead of putting them into, you know, throwing them out there and trying to have them run around to get their fingerprints done, it would be best to just sort of cancel it and hope to pick up again when things are safer. That's what we're going to do, and also a lot of commands can't support the externs right now with the um, health conditions ranging. So, uh, but we are looking forward to restarting soon. I would advise any of you who are interested at all, reach out to me. Um, my contact information will be shared afterwards. You can reach out to me directly with any questions. You can visit our website. We will be updating that with any deadlines or any time we have an application open up, you'll be able to see that there. You'll also be able to see it if you follow us on Facebook or on LinkedIn. So I suggest you do those things too. And that's all I have. Thank you. And now uh, Lieutenant Tallow would like to chime in. Hi guys, so Lieutenant Sally with the Coast Guard. Um, I just wanted to do a quick plug. We are still um, accepting applications for next summer. We had interns this summer. They all work remotely. Um, they came in and checked into their unit. They were given a Coast Guard laptop and sent on their way to work from home. So we are um, still offering internship opportunities uh, our next deadline for next summer is October 31st, 2020. So you still have plenty of time. Um, if you, we also have an externship uh, opportunity. So I'm not sure how COVID is going to change um, externships for the fall, but we have a general email that uh, you can go to to ask for questions. It's Coast Guard DCL at uscg.mil, that's coastguardbcl at uscg.mil, and um, someone will get back to you if you're interested in an externship. But again, we do have um, internship opportunities available at all of our district offices, as well as um, Coast Guard headquarters here in DC. Some of the areas uh, are Boston, uh, Portsmouth, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, Miami, New Orleans, Cleveland, Alameda, uh, New London, Connecticut, Seattle, Honolulu, Cape May, New Jersey, 
or Juneau, Alaska. Um, openings at offices um, vary, so there's going to be you know more more opportunity in DC obviously than some of our smaller offices, but all of those are potential options. Um, huge range of um, areas of practice in all of those offices, so they're really great opportunities. Um, and you just would send a resume, unofficial transcript, and a letter of recommendation as well as a writing sample to that Coast Guard DCL at USDG.mil. And again, that application deadline is October 31st for uh, next summer. Wonderful. And Major Musselman, what about the Air Force? Sure. So uh, we have what we call unpaid externships every semester in the uh, fall and spring. Uh, our fall externs uh, have all been placed for this fall. We'll be opening up the spring externship opportunities likely in the October range. Uh, we will also have summer paid internships for 1Ls uh, and 2Ls, so basically 1L summer and 2L summers. We'll, we typically post those around December uh, through USA Jobs. Uh, which is the worst, by the way, but uh, they make us use it, so follow the directions are, is my pro tip for that. But then the summer, we also have unpaid externships. And so usually over the summer, I have 60 to 70 people that are placed around the country and in the D.C. area. We did the same thing this summer. Rain, some individuals were strictly telework, some individuals were a mix, and just some individuals were in their offices almost every day. It just depended. We just did everything by, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but the externships during the school year over the summer, honestly, externships and internships are a great way to see if, if, you're, if the JAG Corps is a fit for you, and then also it gives you a leg up on your application. Um, we post all of these to our social media accounts, uh, we send it out to the career service offices, and you can always reach our chief of recruiting at airforcejagrecruiting at gmail.com. So we've been pressing with our internships and externships, and we, at least at the moment, don't see that changing for the spring and then the summer. Thanks, Taylor. Wonderful. And um, was told by Captain Irving that the Marine Corps equivalent of an internship um, is the time that you do at Officer of Canada School, um, which typically is done during one of your law school summers. So finally, I will allow Major Shim to close this out on the internship externship opportunity. Thank you, Taylor. So yeah, for the Army, uh, we also have externship and internship opportunities. The externship opportunities are unpaid. Um, but if that's something that you are interested, you can feel free to reach out to anyone at our office really throughout the year and we will, you know, try to, to get you placed in the next kind of semester that would be available if there, you know, is time and availability essentially. Um, but in terms of the internship program, that is a competitive paid internship. It's a two-month paid internship over the summer and so our internship opens, the application window opens just in a few days on August 1st and closes on October 1st. I really encourage you, if you're interested, to look on our website. You can get all the information you need there on jagsdnet.army.mil and, you know, please, you know, look at it, consider it. If, if you're interested in doing the JAG Corps full-time, then that is the best way to get a leg up. Thanks. Wonderful. And um, with that, Major Shim, I will stick with you. Um, a lot of this, I realize, is going to be the same among the services, but if you could just talk a little bit about what are some of the benefits um, that are available to folks who serve as judge advocates in the military. Sure. And I'm assuming that you're talking about, well, I'll start with financial benefits. So. Um, in terms of financial benefits, the big one is the Federal Student Loan Repayment Program, which repays up to $65,000 of your federal student loans in exchange for your first four years of service. And so that would be paid after each of your first three years of service. You would get a third of that $65,000 paid directly toward your federal student loan. 
which is a huge, huge benefit. Um, uh, the other ones, I'll say there is a retention bonus of up to $60,000 after your first four years commitment if you want to re-up for another four years. Um, other benefits are that you, you know, in line with other services, you enter the Army as an officer at an advanced pay grade, which takes into account your law school service. Um, you receive a promotion just about six to eight months after your commission to captain, which is in 03. So that's a lot faster than anyone else coming in as well as a normal, normal officer. Uh, you're, you receive a pay raise every one to two years. Um, there are substantial tax-free benefits. Um, and if you deploy, then your whole pay is tax-free. So that's a huge benefit. There's things like low-cost life insurance, um, post-9-11 GI Bill for anybody who wants to either pursue advanced schooling themselves or pass that on to dependents. Um, there's the thrift savings plan, which is essentially our version of, um, you know, like your, uh, your, uh, your, <laughs> words are escaping me, but essentially your retirement savings plan. Um, which the Army will contribute to in line with, you know, kind of in line with what you're contributing to as well. Um, you know, and then in terms of otherwise, this benefits is benefits like for family, there's a lot of uh, just untold benefits to being in the service. Uh, free medical, dental coverage, you know, your health care, that's a huge one. Um, paid maternity, paternity leave as well. Um, there are things like you get to travel all over the world. Yeah, I was stationed in Hawaii for three years, which was an incredible opportunity, which I wouldn't have otherwise had. And, you know, I could go on and on. There's a million, a million things out there. But, yeah, there's untold benefits to service. Wonderful. And uh, Lieutenant Callie, over to you. Hi hey guys, I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the differences for the Coast Guard. Um, we do commission as O3, so we commission as lieutenants and a higher pay grade. Um, you also promote a little bit faster. Uh, we have a 92% uh, promotion rate, which is pretty outstanding from O3 to O4. Um, so our, our JAGs promote really well in the Coast Guard. Since we compete against everyone, we don't just compete against other attorneys. We have a, a larger pool. Um, for selection, and you also have the opportunity to go out of specialty if that's something you're seeking. You will not be placed in a billet non-legal unless you ask for it. So if you want to come in and be a lawyer the entire time, uh, that is absolutely uh, very likely, uh, but definitely possible. But uh, we do have opportunity outside of legal if you want to seek those opportunities. But um, we do commission and uh, at a higher pay grade and excel and promote a little bit faster than some of the other services. Thank you. And over to you, Major Musselman from the Air Force. Hey, thanks, Taylor. So in the Air Force, uh, when you come in, you come in as an O2, uh, and then you will make O3 within six months. Uh, like the Army, we have the $65,000 student loan repayment program, uh, which you can take part in during your first four years. At year four, there's also a $20,000 sign-on bonus for two more years. And then at year uh, six, it's a $40,000 bonus for four more years. Uh, and then just general benefits overall, what I'll tell you is with because we get a housing allowance, uh, that is effectively 25 to 35 percent of our income, which is tax-free income, which means there's no federal or state taxes taken out of it. It ends up making your disposable income significantly more than salary of, of an equivalent sort of level that's fully taxed, uh, and it's super helpful when it comes time to actually file your taxes. That benefit with the, the housing allowance is, is standard across all of the branches. But um, we have the student loan repayment program. We have the, the continuation pay bonuses as well. Um, and uh, on top of that, we also reimburse for bar dues as well. Um, so those are just some of the, the Air Force benefits. Um, and then we send about 
30 to 35 individuals a year to get paid LLMs at um, civilian and military institutions around the country. Thanks, Taylor. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. And if you listening out there are interested in more of the benefits, um, at least DOD-wise, which is going to be everybody except for Coast Guard, um, will be pretty similar on sort of just the military benefits. Um, Coast Guard is going to be similar. They'll have some distinctions, but a lot of that information is available uh, very generally online, so feel free to check that out. Additionally, if you're curious about where the services are located, I know people have talked a little bit about that. Um, you can, you know, go on any services, not even the JAG Corps, but the, the main military service, and they have um, locators so you can see where a lot of the, the offices are. And since we are um, getting close to our, our time, there's so much more we could answer, and we will provide our information to all of you so that you can reach out to us if you have more specific questions. But I wanted to allow everyone to talk a little bit about what their actual application process is like. So in terms of timelines um, and when folks are actually eligible to apply for active duty service in the JAG Corps. And I will start with Captain Irving, the Marine Corps. Thanks, Taylor. Um, we have a relatively long application process. Uh, we have 72 officers, selection officers, all over the country. Um, so anyone who is interested in the Marine Corps uh, would go through their local officer selection officer. They're probably not going to be an attorney, um, and so they work with me uh, to craft our each fiscal year class of new judge advocates. Um, and so that that's the initial point is to go seek out a officer selection officer. From there, you'll submit your application. If your physical fitness score is not ready, you'll work with that officer selection officer to to get it to the point where it would be competitive on a selection board. After submitting your application, you will go to a, a, a regional selection board where you will compete against every component category, again, ground, air, cyber, and law, for a select number of seats to go to officer candidate school. Um, so usually you will probably go on a board six to eight months before going to OCS. And then once at OCS, we have about a 30% attrition rate at OCS, so you'll need to get through that 10-week that course of training. After that, you'll commission, uh, and depending on where you are in law school, you'll start to work with me to manage your accession to active duty. Um, that's, that's the general timeline. You can apply either as a senior in college or as or any year during law school. Um, but I tell every applicant I talk to, it's better to apply earlier than later um, because you can't guarantee a selection and we can't guarantee a uh, successful completion of officer candidate school because that will ultimately fall on each applicant's shoulders. Uh, and in terms of what we're looking for in potential applicants, um, we want both attorneys and Americans who are devoted to leadership. So if you see yourself as a leader or see in yourself something that you want to become a leader, uh, the Marine Corps gives you both that and legal expertise in its training pipeline and in its service. And that's all I got, Taylor. Wonderful. Next, I will turn it over to Lieutenant Strauss to tell us about the Navy's application process. Thank you. So for the Navy, you can start applying after you complete 1L year. The best thing that you can do is to sort of go to our website and see if there are any deadlines coming up. There aren't right now, but there will be one coming up soon. So for the student program, which I would recommend if you're in law school, that should be like the one that you apply to. It's where you have, you're going to have the best chance of getting in. For that one, you can start applying after your 1L year. The application process, like the other services, is quite long and intense. Um, so you're going to need to request a structured interview, which is, you know, our interview, the way we do it is it's scored. Um, it's confidential. It's like top secret stuff. Um, 
after you get the structured interview, you, your application package can be submitted and it's considered complete if it has all of the required documents. You would need to make like a Prime Mod account. All of these things are very minor. The biggest thing is pretty much getting the structured interview done. And then as long as you can get your resume, your transcripts, all of the normal stuff that you would need for the other services, then you'd be fine. Um, so you can apply as a 2L and you can apply again as a 3L. After that, you're no longer eligible for our student program, so it's a different pipeline. Now you're going to be applying at the direct session, and it's a little bit different, and the application process looks a little bit different. And again, I would recommend visiting the website for that. Right now, we're not even accepting any direct session applications, so the next one would be coming up soon. But um, that's why I say your best chance is to just try to get in while you're in law school for the student program. And it is a competitive process. Um, but I think it's more competitive once you're out of law school. So I would take that for what it's worth. And also, like I said before, if you have any questions with regard to the application process, feel free to reach out to me. I work at Code 61. This is my job to help you all. You know, if you guys have questions, if you can't find the website, or if you can't find, you know, the right place on the website, let me know. I'm here to help. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty much going to be that. And then once you're selected or professionally recommended, we call it, you're going to have to go through a commissioning process, and that's quite intense as well. You're going to need to, you know, have a background check. You're going to have your, you know, you're going to get weighed. You're going to have your height taken. You're going to go through, you know, your medical screening, and all of this can take a while. So it is best, like the other um, services will say, it is best to start as soon as possible because, you know, the quicker you get commissioned, the better it is for you financially. So. Um, starting sooner is better. <laughs> That's my, uh, so I'll leave you with. Thank you. And Major Muffman, how about the Air Force? Sure. So the most common way to enter the Air Force JAG Corps is to apply to our direct appointment program as a as a 3L. We actually have, uh, or a practicing attorney, or, or graduate awaiting licensing. We have three boards a year for that program. One is currently open now, uh, and you can submit an online application by August 10th. We also have a board in November and another one in April. And we encourage individuals to apply early and apply often. You can roll interviews and applications forward. Uh, we select 3Ls, graduate awaiting licensing, and licensed attorneys at every single one of our boards. Uh, we also have entry programs for 1Ls and 2Ls as well that pairs with Air Force ROTC. And you can find an explanation of all these eligibility programs at www.airforce.com backslash JAG or email me as well. But yeah, we have uh, hiring boards right now uh, open for our September board, and then we'll have our November board shortly thereafter, and then our April board. So um, COVID aside, our hiring is forecasted and ongoing as normal uh, to the same extent it was last year. So thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Taylor. And next, we will hear from the Coast Guard. Hi, guys. Um, so we have a three-part application uh, process. So step one is going to be going to see a recruiter. Um, our recruiters are not um, lawyers, so I would also strongly recommend reaching out to the Coast Guard DCL uh, email address that I mentioned earlier, coastguarddcl at usdv.mil. But you will start um, by going to see a recruiter, and you have a paper, paper package, which includes a resume, a letter of recommendation, uh, transcripts, and a writing sample. And then once you get that um, packet in, you go to an interview. Our interview process is also um, a board, so you'll have three people interviewing you. And then finally, you go through, you have to pass um, MEP. So you do a physical, um, you have to pass a physical. Uh, we also um, have a, we're still accepting applications. Our next deadline is October 26, 2020. So we uh, can take applications from 3L law students as well as licensed attorneys. Um, but step one, uh, I think, is going to be going 
to that email so that you actually talk to a Coast Guard lawyer uh, before heading to that uh, your local recruiter. All of this is on um, our website, gocoastguard.com, uh, but the, uh, the email address is going to connect you with our accessions officer, and um, he would be happy to kind of walk you through it and explain everything. But it is a long process, um, so I would start, I realize October seems forever away, but um, getting all of the um, paper package together can take a long time, as well as setting up an interview and getting you through uh, MEP. So I would absolutely suggest starting starting soon. But if you guys have any questions, you can also reach out to me um, or that email address. Thank you. And finally, we will wrap up with our very last response uh, with Major Shim from the Army. Sure, yeah, so our application process to the Army uh, consists of interview and applying to an online portal with a number of documents that are going to be, you know, standard as across the board. You can look those up on our website. Uh, in terms of our time frame, we only have one board a year. So if anyone is interested in applying, it opens again August 1st. It closes October 1st. And that's our annual board. Um, the interview would have to occur sometime between that same time frame. You would either, if you're at a school right now, there will be someone assigned, a judge advocate assigned to your school who will be corresponding with your career services office to set up interviews with anyone interested. So you can reach out through your career service office to figure that out. Or if you're out of law school, then that's something where you can just look up. We'll be posting the names of all of our field screening officers online. And you can find those folks, uh, whoever is going to be close to you this year. We're doing exclusively virtual interviews due to COVID. Um, so that will make it a little bit easier in, in terms of coordinating an interview time and location, obviously. And so, you know, the other thing, I'll say is because, well, in terms of when to apply, the earliest you can apply to the Army is going to be the fall semester of your 3L year. And so you can apply for an internship the fall semester of your 2L year, but if that's just for the internship, that there is not currently a means to immediately give you an offer of commission at the close of an internship. Um, but if you do complete an internship, it gives you a huge leg up in the board because at that point you, you've been vetted by, you know, a, a local OSJA. Um, and so that's, that's essentially the application process for the Army. I encourage anyone to go to our website at jagcnet.army.mil slash JRO, and you can, you know, get all the details in terms of what the requirements are for the application there. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you to all of our panelists today and to everyone who attended. Um, as I said previously, we'll make sure that you all have access to our contact information, um, and we are so grateful for the Federal Bar Association for helping us put this together today so that we could reach all of you. Uh, feel free to share the news of the JAG Corps um, and the wonderful way of, of serving um, and, and being a lawyer with friends who maybe were not able to attend. The one thing I can tell you from being involved in recruiting the last four years and working a lot with all the different services is that um, everyone kind of ends up in the right service if this is right for them. Um, but we've all kind of talked about how we could have been happy in multiple services. Um, it really is a wonderful way to serve and to practice law and to really get a lot of um, kind of exciting opportunities, not, you know, sort of do the same thing every day. Um, so if you are interested, continue to do research and pursue, reach out to folks and get input. Um, and just 
stay safe the rest of your summer, and we look forward to hearing from a lot of you in the future. And with that, I will turn it over back to Laura with the FBA. Thanks so much, Taylor, and thank you to all of our presenters today. We hope the attendees enjoyed the presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me directly if you would like to be connected with any of our presenters. Um, please remember to take the survey at the end of the panel and join us for our next webinar um, on Monday, August 10th for Careers in Tax Law. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.